Uh, well, welcome to another meeting of the uh, Libertarian Alliance, which we held here every month. Uh, this month we have Stephen Berry talking on uh, Bretton Woods Agreement and the collapse of the British Empire. Uh, this talk that I'm about to give was, is inspired by this book, which um, you can see there is the, the Battle of Bretton Woods, and it's by someone called Ben Steele. It's very good, and I recommend you to uh, either buy it or um, uh, borrow it if you can. Um, this is something that comes up uh, periodically in Bretton Woods. There was a crisis in 2008, and um, the world leaders then... Uh, often talked about rethinking the um, world financial system and of course Bretton Woods was an example of when world leaders got together and came up with a new financial system uh, and this is the main uh, th uh, story in, of this book and um, how the financial system was uh, devised how long it lasted and how it ended uh, that's one of the uh, topics there, but it's also about the two main architects of um, the Bretton Woods system, and that is uh, John Maynard Keynes and Harry Dexter White. Um, they're central to this book, and uh, interesting, very interesting character in their own light. And um, perhaps incidentally, this is a theme that came through, and I don't know if Ben Steele thought that it, it was uh, so important, but it's really about... Uh, the fall of one great power, namely Britain, and the rapid rise of another, that's America, of course, um, at the end of, uh, before the First World War, rather, the British national debt had been falling steadily for a century, and it was only 25% of uh, GDP, but by the end of the Second World War, it had risen to 250%, the level it was after the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, Britain was... Uh, if we quote uh, Keynes, facing a financial Dunkirk, um, and the Americans are in a much better position. Lord Halifax, who was the uh, British ambassador to the US uh, during the war, uh, met Keynes, and um, he once whispered to Keynes uh, about the Americans, he said, it's true they have the money bags, but we have all the brains. Um, and I don't know whether Halifax was just flattering Keynes, because remember, Keynes was really the first celebrity economist, and he was sent to America uh, as Britain's probably greatest and most persuasive economic uh, beggar. And um, he was about to find out, as was Halifax, whether it was going to be Keynes's brains which were going to decide what happened at Bretton Woods or the American money. Um, Ben Steele is um, he's a good writer and he's a professional economist. So he gives a chapter, devotes a chapter to Keynes, which I want to discuss in some detail. And um, he steers clear of all the Bloomsbury stuff and sticks mainly to the economics. And there, uh, according to Steele, there are two ideas which were pretty constant in the thought of Keynes. And uh, one of them was the... Uh, diminution in the role of gold and the other was London as a financial centre in the world and uh, even before the First World War Keynes was sceptical about gold there's, there's an interesting quote in an article which he wrote in the um, Economic Journal in 1914 and he said that if gold is at last deposed from its despotic control over us and reduced to the position of a constitutional monarch. A new chapter of history will have opened. Man will have made another step forward in the attainment of self-government. And of course, 1914 was the uh, year of the outbreak of the First World War, and, and really the um, point at which London was challenged as an economic uh, and financial centre uh, by New York. Um, I should point out that before 1914, Keynes was wedded to some of the old orthodoxies. Uh, he thought that uh, falling prices were better than rising ones because the former benefited wage earners and creditors over entrepreneurs and debtors, and this led to a more equal distribution of wealth. 
and he thought this was a more just setup. He was also a secretary of the Cambridge University Free Trade Association, and he thought that the community as a whole could not hope to gain by making artificially scarce what the country wanted. So you can see that before 1914, he was rather a dull fellow compared with uh, the later Keynes. Uh, when the war broke out, he left Cambridge and joined the Treasury. Uh, and as long as he was th there, he was exempted from military service. But um, in 1916, conscription was brought in in this country. And Keynes lodged an official conscientious objection uh, on the grounds that conscription violated his freedom of choice. Uh, Steele speculates as to why Keynes did this. He said he was under considerable pressure from his Bloomsbury friends and uh, other people such as Bertrand Russell and uh, D.H. Lawrence. Um, and they even wanted him to resign his treasury position and oppose the war. And Steele thinks that the conscientious objection application was an insurance policy so that if he lost his treasury uh, position, uh, he was still wouldn't have to serve in the war. I mean, it's also, I think it's also possible that, you know, I think before that, this period, I think Keynes was something of a classical liberal. Uh, and um, he probably f genuinely thought that conscription was uh, a moral wrong, you know, and uh, as he said, uh, it violated his freedom of choice. Um, after, uh, in fact, after the uh, defeat of Germany in November uh, 1918, uh, Keynes attended the uh, Versailles Peace Conference, but resigned before the final treaty was uh, signed because um, he thought that the uh, provisions of Versailles were economically stupid. He wrote a book called The Economic Consequences of the Peace, which was a critique of uh, Versailles. And uh, I, I've got this book and I reread it when I was uh, uh, writing this piece, and uh, there's lots of things in it which uh, classical li liberals would agree with. You know, he, he, he pays uh, great attention to the um, development of the European economy between 1870 and 1914. He, um, he points out, and I'll, I'll quote him here, that the various currencies which were all maintained on a stable basis in relation to gold and to one another facilitated the easy flow of capital and of trade to an extent the full value of which we only realize now when we are deprived of its advantages. And uh, Keynes also said in this book, you know, the, the accumulations of fixed capital, which had developed in this period before the First World War, uh, were built up and they could never have come about in a society where wealth was divided equally. So he was taking the stab at um, the socialists there. And I think Keynes saw that the, the Great War was a massive and uh, quite undesirable uh, hiatus in European economic development. And it was important that normal service should be resumed as soon as possible. As he said, if, if Germany is going to be milked, it must not first be ruined. And um, this was the uh, gist of the economic consequences of the peace. He was following a, a classical liberal thinker here called Norman Angel, who had print, uh, published his book, The Great Illusion, before the First World War. And um, Angel had pointed out that uh, the problem with these great, great indemnities, which are imposed on the uh, defeated, is not so much the payment by the defeated as, as, as getting it by the victor. Because in order to be paid by the uh, vanquished, you know, you have to buy the goods of the um, vanquished. The victor has to buy the goods of the vanquished to, to get the money. And uh, the problem about the, this, this situation was that it tended to disturb and dislocate the market, which made the production of wealth and distribution of wealth possible. And it, he, was pretty, uh, he was pretty clear on this was Keynes. And I wonder if he had read uh, Angel, actually, uh, in his book. <coughs> Um, it's really in the 1920s, I think, that Keynes um, begins to become a Keynesian, if you like. So I, I would say up to up till the economic consequence of the peace is pretty well 
uh, still a classical liberal. And in the 1920s, it becomes a Keynesian, or what we all understand now as uh, a Keynesian. And uh, in the immediate uh, aftermath of the war, Keynes's uh, anger was directed against the Bank of England, which was trying to restore the pre-war uh, dollar, dollar sterling parity of uh, $4.86. And uh, Keynes began his attack on the bank's belief that uh, the wages were su su um, sufficiently flexible to bring about this outcome. Um, in a lecture at the National Liberal Club in 1923, he said, the, the more troublous the times, the worse does laissez-faire work. But he didn't offer any uh, revolutionary prescriptions to this. And um, it wasn't until... Uh, a year or two later, in 1923, that um, he wrote his A Tract on Monetary Reform, and a book, by the way, which Milton Friedman thought was his best book. And uh, the main argument of this, it, and you, you can see Keynesian de Keynesianism developing here, is that it's the demand of money, it's the demand for money rather than, rather than the supply that the monetary authorities should aim to stabilize. Uh, and that, Central banks need to intervene, intervene actively to vary the supply of currency notes uh, and bank reserves. Uh, this is this, of course, is quite different from the old gold standard system, where the central bank simply loosened credit when gold flowed in and tightened credit when gold flowed, flowed out. Um, in the mid 1920s, uh, Churchill re returned um, Britain to the gold standard at the pre-war parity. Um, Keynes was strongly opposed to that. He, um, he said uh, he thought that um, in modern conditions, wages in this country are for various reasons so rigid over short periods that it is impractical to adjust them to the ebb and flow of the international gold credit and I would deliberately utilize fluctuations in the exchange as the shock, shock absorber. So you, you can see the beginning of the, uh, one of the main Keynesian arguments here. Uh, but he did say, even at this point, he said that um, uh, his criticism of the conservative government never made him a socialist, uh, and he never wanted uh, wealth redistribution. He said the Labour Party is a class party, and that class is not my class. If I'm going to pursue sectionalist interests at all, I shall pursue my own. The class war will find me on the side of the educated bourgeoisie. And uh, it wasn't just the educated bourgeoisie, he was the wealthy bourgeoisie. He was a very successful investor. Uh, he did lose in 1929 when the uh, Great Crash occurred and his fortune fell, but he made another one afterwards, and for, both for himself and his um, Cambridge College. Uh, and then, uh, 18, in 1930, shortly after this, he published his major, first major theoretical work, his Treatise on Money. And uh, this, was, this was a more theoretical analysis of the British attempt to return to the gold standard in the 1920s. Um, it, it was again. It, it's this business that um, the stickiness in the market, ma mainly uh, the labour market, and he said it can be due to trade unions, or institutional blockages, or mere psychological quirks. Uh, but um, whereas classical economists thought that these difficulties could, should be tackled by political action, it was Keynes who believed that it was monetary policy which should adjust to what he considered the natural tendencies of society. I mean, we're still getting this at the moment with the euro, and we have one school of thought which says that uh, monetary policy, namely the euro, should ac accommodate to economic difficulties in the Mediterranean states. And we've got the other line of thought which says that um, there should be political reforms, labor market reforms within the countries which are having difficulties uh, with growth. Um, I mean, all I say on that is that, you know, I think you've got to do one or the other. You know, you can't just do nothing. 
And uh, as far as I can see, in the Mediterranean countries at the moment, they're doing nothing, or very little. Um, Keynes had another uh, quite controversial idea in the uh, treatise, and that is that, and, and he, was, he was particularly, I don't know, some reason he was particularly opposed to uh, savings. And uh, he said that, um, he said, it's not the thrift of our ancestors that we owe our present wealth and heritage of cultural monuments, but to the animal spirits of their more spendthrift and enterprising kin. And there's a quite illuminating quote in that book, which was, were the seven wonders of the world built by thrift, Keynes asks. I deem it doubtful, he said. And so do I, actually, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, you know, the pyramids weren't built by uh, thrift, they were built by slave labor. And the surplus extracted from the Egyptian population at the time. It's similar to the London Olympic Games. You know, they weren't built by thrift at all. You know, they were built by taxes extracted from the British population at the time. But um, I think it's true to say that the economies of both Egypt of the pharaohs and the Britain of the present days provides the surplus to fund these uh, cultural monuments. And thrift certainly has played a role in building uh, those up. Uh, Keynes became even more of a revolutionary after that book. Um, he, uh, he made a lecture in, in, in Dublin in 1933, and uh, he said that he recognized the advantages of gradually bringing the producer and the consumer within the ambit of the same national economic and financial organization. And then he, uh, he made it even clearer. He said, let goods be homespun whenever it is reasonably and conveniently possible. And above all, let finance be primarily national and uh, Oswald Mosley, when he um, heard, this, uh, heard about this speech, sent him a letter of congratulation, which was rather to Keynes' embar embarrassment. So you can see that really, Keynes was a classical liberal, as far as I can see it pretty well at the end of the uh, First World War. And in the, over the next 15 years, he pretty well changed his views to uh, what we now know him as. Um, of course, he didn't take this business about national, um, what was the actual phrase that he used? Let goods be homespun whenever it's reasonably and conveniently possible. And above all, let finance be primary national. But he didn't take this too much to heart because um, he himself uh, carried on investing uh, heavily in Wall Street and made lots of money. So he didn't actually <laughs> put all his uh, investments into... Um, uh, British stocks. Um, by the mid 1930s, Keynes was preparing a revolution, and uh, one which has been very successful. George Bernard Shaw wrote to uh, Keynes around about this time and say, "Take Marx more seriously." And uh, Keynes replied on New Year's uh, Day, 1935. He said he was writing a book on economic theory which will largely revolutionize, not I suppose at once, but in the course of the next 10 years, the way the world thinks about economic problems. And Keynes said, as for Marx, his economic value, apart from occasional flashes of insight, is nil. Well, I think Keynes was right on that. And he also turned out he was right on uh, his book, that it, it would be hugely influential. <laughs> and he published it in 1936, The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money. Uh, I think both Marx and Keynes saw in capitalism the seeds of its own demise. But whereas Marx was pleased about this, I think Keynes wanted to save it. And he thought it could be saved by judicious uh, government intervention. Um, Steele, uh, as it covers the uh, ideas of the general theory pretty well, um, I think one of the most revolutionary is Keynes's contention that the economy had no natural tendency to full employment. Classical economists held that um, involuntary unemployment was a result of interference with the price mechanism. Keynes maintained that falling wages, if they lowered demand, could actually worsen unemployment. <coughs> he also made a criticism of um, Say's law, which was uh, that supply creates its own demand. 
and Kane set out to prove it was false. Um, I mean, I, I happen to think Say's law is correct, and that uh, you can't get, uh, you can only get gluts when you've got overproduction of the uh, wrong kind of goods. But Keynes thought this was all back to front. He said it was not demand, it was demand rather, not supply, which determined the level of economic activity. And investment which called forth the requisite savings. And he, he has this big idea, demand as a result of purely psychological factors could at any time be insufficient to ensure full employment. Um, and I suppose this was the uh, major point of the general theory, could, could, could you have a situation of persistent mass unemployment while the market was in equilibrium, as the economist calls it? And um, could, could mass unemployment persist if all prices were perfectly flexible? This is, plainly, if this is true, you can have a slump forever unless uh, something, uh, or it's maybe probably the government steps in to stop it. And um, so you have, was the Japanese malaise of the 1990s a result of the premature termination of fiscal st stimulus, as the Keynesians believed, or was it the result of an excessive reliance on fiscal stimulus, as more classical economists believed? And this debate I, I, hasn't been resolved. I mean, I thought the whole Keynesian thing had been killed in the 1970s when we saw the emergence of stagflation in the uh, so, so British Japanese. economy. So it's the John Hicks. Yeah, and, I, I, and then suddenly, particularly after the 2008 crisis, Keynesian jumps up, Keynesianism jumps up again. And, um, you know, it's kind of like the bloke who's um, been written off as dead and suddenly... <laughs> well, that monster of the Hercules kept defeating him. So. Defeated him, become twice as strong as him. Uh, Keynes also pointed out that uh, another failing, as he saw it with modern capitalism, that was that... Um, Investment, even given flexible prices, could fail to harmonise with savings. Uh, this is this, this problem. Uh, Keynes gave the name of liquidity preference uh, to it, and this was the propensity of people to hoard cash rather than consume or invest the fruits of their labour. And uh, this was a crucial part of the Keynes' uh, system. Uh, it was strongly criticised by Keynes' chief French critic, uh, Jacques Ruff. And uh, Ruff always maintained that the demand for additional cash holdings, or what Keynes called the propensity to hoard, had to be equivalent in its economic effects to the demand for consumption goods or investment goods. Uh, I think Ruff's argument is sound, actually. And I think you can see it most clearly if you look at um, a commodity-based monetary system, such as the pre-1914 gold standard. In this system, it, the demand for money was necessarily equivalent to the demand for mining, moving, and monetizing gold. So it's not a demand for nothing. And uh, Roof held that uh, this argument also applied to a fiat money system, where the central bank issued cash in return for securities. And these securities represented wealth, which is either stored up or more generally on its way through the process of production. So to demand money is not to demand nothing, as Keynes implied, but to demand real wealth capable of being monetized within the framework of the existing system. Uh, Roof, actually, I think he saw that the end result of Keynesianism would be inflation and a private economy which would be less able to produce the goods that people wanted. And um, as I said, this view became widespread in the 70s with the appearance of stagflation. Um, and I think most economists now, I think the, is that the, the, the 1936 work is uh, to be looked at as a, a, a study in depression economics, really. But it's, it's not a general theory, but it's um, just something that you could look at in a period of depression. Anyway, I, I spent quite a while on Keynes, partly because it's uh, quite interesting. Uh, but also to give you a flavour of this book. In other words, this book is written by an economist, and it's not just, you know, a, a guy who's a, a, a biographer or a, a historian writing an account. You have got a professional economist who gives a clear um, description of Keynesianism 
uh, as well as the events which uh, Keynes was involved in. Uh, the other main protagonist at uh, Bretton Woods, uh, and uh, this was the American representative, was Harry Dexter Wyatt. And uh, he was everything that Keynes wasn't. You know, he was born to uh, Lithu poor Lithuanian immigrants to the US. He was a self-made man. He worked for his um, family's hardware stores, uh, stores after he graduated. When America declared war on um, Germany in 1917, he didn't, uh, like Keynes, uh, register as a conscientious objector. He actually went over and enlisted in the army and served in France. And um, after uh, the war, he, he, he got a, eventually managed to get an academic post and got himself um, appointed to some uh, very minor government jobs, which he held rather tenuously in Washington. And he had to have, have the contract continually renewed. So you see, you've got the picture where Keynes is um, you know, moving effortlessly, really, between Cambridge University and the British Treasury, whereas this Harry Dexter White had uh, precarious appointments. Um, Keynes was obviously a talented writer, uh, influential theoretician, but White was really uh, a bureaucrat, but a very efficient, efficient one, you know, the sort of guy who gets the job done, impress, impress the uh, American Treasury with this. And, uh, but the curiosity is that Keynes, he was a member of the educated elite, but basically believed in capitalism, I think, although capitalism would need Keynes' genius to be saved. But Harry Dexter White, who was the working class boy who made good, was in fact a Soviet spy, <laughs> as uh, events have turned out. Um, Steele tries to understand the motives for this in, um, by examining an essay that White wrote towards the end of World War II. And um, White just sees the US financially dominant, but sharing this domination with a powerful Soviet Union, and these two powers keeping the peace. And he also was, in, like a lot of people at the time, first by the 20th century, he was impressed by the uh, Soviet Union. He said, uh, he said, Russia is the first instance of a socialist economy in action, and it works, exclamation mark. Um, he thought that the capitalist countries were moving in the direction of uh, more state control of industry. And uh, I, I guess he might have read James Burnham's book, The Manager Revolution. He certainly read the British socialist Harold Lasky, who wrote this book called Faith, Reason, and Civilization. And uh, Lasky said in this book, he said, since the October Revolution, more men and women have had more opportunities of self-fulfillment than anywhere else in the world. Um, it's, it's, it sounds slightly bizarre now, you know, but this is, this is, of course, how socialists thought in the first half of the, a lot of socialists thought in the first half of the 20th century. And remember, Lasky was chairman of the British Labour Party in 1945, and uh, the Labour Party was about to create the NHS, Hurrah, uh, yeah. And this NHS system uh, shows every indication of lasting longer than the Soviet Union. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, the Soviet Union lasted from 1917 to 1991, I believe. That's what, 74, I call it 75 years. And the NHS is 1948 to 2014. Uh, 14, so, 14. Far. so we, <laughs> just a bit of math, maths is 52 and 14 is 66 years. You know, you would back it, it, it doing it now. I never, you'd never think it was possible. But, um, and even if it doesn't survive in uh, England, or it should survive in Scotland, surely. Oh, forever. <laughs> forever. Especially when they get, if they get independence. Um, but also, so, of course, it was more popular. The NHS is more popular. That is a fact. But, but anyway, that, that, that was how, um, that was the, situation just before the, um, just, sorry, just after the Second World War. And um, basically, 
I think why just thought, and I'm sure lots of people like Philby thought, that the uh, that, that America would be allies with the Soviet Union after the uh, Second World War, and uh, the, the, and America would be going to look more like the Soviet Union rather than the Soviet Union becoming to look, look more like America eventually, as it has. Um, so uh, Harry Dexter White. As I said, he was a talented um, bureaucrat. He got the organization of the uh, conference, and he, 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 he did that in such a way that it was advantageous to the US. And uh, he had his own uh, ideas about what the system after World War, much system after World War II should be. Keynes proposed a, a system on an international fiat currency called Bancor. Uh, you know, obviously, bank or or at the end is gold. You see, people were still influenced by gold at the time. They were moving away from gold, but it, the influence was still there. And where, whereas uh, Keynes proposed this international currency, which would, in certain circumstances, be converted into gold, uh, White proposed the dollar as the basis of the world economic order, and. Um, that would be convertible, the dollar would be convertible to gold. And that was the situation until 1971. He, he said the gold in Fort Knox was why the United States was in an enviable position, why we are the powerful nation at this conference, uh, because we have the wherewithal to buy any currency we want. If only England was in that position or any other of the other countries, it would be a very different story. Of course, and the, and, and the system that was developed in the end was that uh, uh, all the other, the central banks of all the other major countries could exchange their dollars for gold if they wanted. You know, you couldn't, like they'll get, you couldn't exchange pounds for gold or francs for gold or, or Deutschmarks for gold. Uh, but, and in fact, normal citizens couldn't ex, uh, exchange their dollars for gold. But the central banks of the uh, countries like France or Germany or Britain could exchange their dollars with the central banks, central bank in the US. Uh, and of course, America had massive gold holdings at the end of uh, World War II. Um, Keynes sort of, he didn't want this, he didn't like it, you know, because it would mean that America was clearly the uh, top dog here. And uh, he, he did say to the U.S. that um, if they carried on like this, uh, the, the uh, Britain and the other countries had a fallback position, which was barter. He said Br Britain might be forced to some very unacceptable means of pushing our foreign trade. He said uh, basically that they could Britain could push its goods into foreign markets by bilateral trade. Uh, deals. He said, Germany's been doing this for years. This is the Nazis, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, compelling foreign holders of marks to redeem them for German goods. And he said, Britain could do the same with block sterling balances uh, and making, you know, throughout the empire, making them convertible into goods which Britain chose to make available. But uh, with it, I think Keynes has been a bit optimistic here. Uh, Lionel Robbins, who was in the, on the British delegation at Bretton Woods, he said he recorded a special meeting between Keynes and the in Indian delegation on this sterling balance question. And the Indian delegation caused a scene by saying they wanted to turn some of their huge sterling debt into dollars so they could use these dollars to buy something useful, you know. Because <laughs> the British economy at the time was just producing war goods, you know, munitions and all the basic implements of war, and didn't really have much that anybody wanted to buy. <laughs> that was that was the problem. And uh, e e the Egyptians also joined. Who, Egypt, Egypt was also at the conference. Joined with India um, in demanding some international magic to give their pounds the ability to purchase something that is wanted. Um, uh, so I don't think it was much of a, a threat from Keynes that. And uh, the um, Harry Dexter White plan was adopted. Uh, 
why it's still thought, and a lot of people still thought in terms of um, being very wary of uh, Britain in the immediate aftermath of uh, World War II as a, you know, as a challenger to US power. Um, but of course, if he was very wary of Britain, he was even more uh, critical of uh, Germany in late 1944, because um, Morgenthau, uh, Henry Morgenthau, who was the American um, Treasury Secretary, who was Harry Dexter White's boss, and basically was the guy who you know, pushed White, uh, he proposed in late 1944 a plan to deindustrialize Germany. Uh, it's called the Morgenthau Plan. And Churchill, who was already hunting for American money at the Quebec conference about that time, was an enthusiastic convert. And um, <coughs> this was basically a plan to deindustrialize Germany and turn Germany into a sort of pastoral paradise, you know, where it's incredibly, <laughs> incredibly weak and could, couldn't uh, produce anything. And, uh, of course, other politicians could see what was wrong with this. Eden um, was, was uh, livid about it and said, how on earth is Germany going to be able to pay for imports if it doesn't actually manufacture anything? And um, Cordell Hull, the American Secretary of State, called the Morgenthau Plan blind vengeance. And as soon as the plan leaked out, um, it was a complete disaster. Goebbels said... He said, it's proof the Anglo-Saxons are just like the Bolsheviks. They want to wipe out 30 to 40 million Germans. Uh, Thomas Dewey in the US, who was an important uh, senator, I believe, he said, uh, he, he said, the news is as good as 10 fresh German divisions. And uh, the near miraculous revitalization of the German army at the end of 1944, when it launched its counterattack, he, he said, he put this down to the Morgenthau plan, you know, the Germans are now really going to fight <laughs> if they were going to be wiped out. Um, and there's in the further point, of course, that if you work, if you uh, weaken uh, Germany dramatically in the post-war environment, you strengthen the Soviet Union. And I think Harry Dexter White saw that, and that was probably a motive for him pushing this plan through. Because as soon as the plan became uh, more widely known, uh, it ran into problems. And I, I think people could see that it, was, it would have been even worse than Versailles as regards for its economic um, effects. And um, Roosevelt and Churchill soon began to retreat from it. Uh, but let's, let, let's, let's, let's leave Germany for a minute and come back to Britain. After the Bretton Woods uh, agreement had been um, signed, uh, the, the British got an American loan because they were broke. And uh, this, uh, both the Bretton Woods Agreement and the American loan had to be ratified by the British Parliament in November 1945. And uh, the truth was being to sink in in Britain that they'd won the war, but they were totally broke. And uh, when this truth came home, all the politicians got madder and madder, you know. And... Uh, one M M Tory MP, David Eccles, described Britain as a small nation standing between the revised imperialism of Russia and the commercial aggression of America. He, uh, he called the terms of the agreement harsh and unworthy of two allies who have just saved the world by their exertions. He said, but, uh, you know, beggars can't be choosers. The dollars were indispensable. He would vote in its favor. Keynes spoke in the House of Lords. And um, he said... Uh, he had some sympathies with the sacrifices that Britain had made, but it was not becoming for us to respond by showing our medals. <laughs> um, the financial agreement was carried by a large margin in both Houses of Parliament, and the British debt to the US uh, was only actually repaid in full with the final instalment of 83 million in December 2006 yes. under the government of Tony Blair. Um, it's, and this was just, just the first of a number of bitter pills that the British had to swallow. Uh, Churchill said it, of course, Churchill Lude said, I haven't become Prime Minister uh, to do, of this country 
to oversee the dissolution of the British <laughs> Empire. <laughs> of but, but, yes. but of course, this is precisely what happened. And he, he said in the House of Commons in '46, he said the, the British Empire seems to be running off almost as fast as the American loan. Uh, Churchill uh, said in a speech, he said, the haste is appalling. But Keynes, who died in April 46, had seen it all coming. In February, just before he died, he said, um, he says, take the case of Egypt. Uh, and remember, Brit Britain still occupied Egypt then. He said, he said, how are we going to reply to the Egyptian demand that we take our troops out of Egypt? He said, is it fully appreciated that the Egyptians are actually paying the costs of these troops being there. And what are we going to do when the Egyptians say, well, we're not going to pay you any more <laughs> money to keep your troops in our country? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think it just took, just took a while to sit, for it to sink in that um, uh, keeping British force in India evidently cost about 500 million a year and in the Middle East, 300 million a year. And this was about a quarter of the American loan. Um, the real... Uh, point at which it became clear that the British Empire was collapsing uh, was the winter, winter of 46, 47. I think it's a very bad winter. I've, I've read about it. It's a very bad winter in this country, one of the coldest winters in um, years more, more. living memory, yeah. And at that time, I think the Labour, Labour were in process of nationalising the coal industry. And I don't know the full details of it, but evidently... Manning Shinwell. Yeah. Uh, Shinwell. Evidently, at that time, precisely in the coldest winter, for a hundred years, you say, but for, you know, one of the God's winters, coal ran out. Yes. <laughs> yeah, know. the USSR so the, winter the, the, and the USSR coal supply. And uh, so there were the, the, the background is really, I think there was a political collapse. Um, and... Um, in January of 47, uh, Attlee signed an independence agreement with the Burmese. On the February the 14th, uh, Bevin announced that um, Britain's Palestine mandate would be handed back to the UN, so they were withdrawing from Palestine. On the, um, and on the 20, sorry, on the 18th of February, the, the cabinet agreed to withdraw troops from Greece. And then on the 20th, the big one, uh, Atlee announced that Britain would leave India uh, in 47, I believe it was. And um, I think it was clear then that, you know, to many in 1946, and even to a few people today, it was, it's almost still believed that Britain gained economically from empire. But I think these events show it's clear that, that the empire was a, a dollar drain and Britain just didn't have the economic muscle to deal with the... Um, places like India and other places which were uh, taking advantage of British weakness to say, well, look, you know, we want to run our own show. Um, and that's really the, uh, it, that, that month, February, January, February 47, really is, it is uh, the writing on the wall for the British Empire as far as I can see. And it happens because Britain is broke. Uh, it took a lot of people by surprise. I think Dean Atchison, who was an Anglophile in the American State Department is, it said, you know, they um, uh, just after this said there are only two powers left now. He said, um, referring to the United States and Soviet Union, he says the British are finished, and of course he was right. Uh, in 1949, Britain devalued sterling by 30 percent. Um, Keynes and White had debated for hours the role of the IMF uh, at Bretton Woods. Uh, and what to do when a country wanted to change its exchange rate. In the end, Britain gave the IMF 24 hours notice. Uh, in 1956, Britain took part in an attempt to prevent the Egyptian leader Nasser from nationalizing the Suez Canal. By the way, you often talk, they often talk about, um, uh, you know, these nationalizations. One was Mossadegh in 53 um, in Iran who uh, nationalized what was, I think, Anglo-Iranian, which is part of what we now know as BP, and then Nasser, of course, nationalised the Suez Canal in '56. But of course, if you think of it from their point of view, they were only doing, they never did this before, Labour started nationalising in this country. You know, they were taking the lead from what had happened in Britain. You know, if you can nationalise your railways and your steel industry and whatever, whatever else it was that they nationalised, but well, we can nationalize stuff as well. 
you know, and what are you going to say about that? Um, anyway, the, the, Britain took part in an operation to prevent this from happening, and the America, America used its control of the IMF to deny dollars to uh, Britain to counter a run on sterling. And um, it also blocked UK efforts to uh, secure emergency oil supplies. Uh, and then that was, 50, that was in 56. And then the following year, the Conservative government, and it's a Conservative government which is, was always the strongest defender of empire, the Conservative government began the process of getting rid of the rest of the empire. Um, the end of Bretton Woods is covered in this book uh, quite well. Um, it, in the 1960s, the US began spending uh, vast amounts of money on so social programs and also on the Vietnam War. And uh, the dollar began to weaken. It's, in the mid-1960s, de Gaulle said, um, the French um, Prime Minister de Gaulle said, President rather, uh, the world had no choice but to accept the international monetary system known as the gold exchange standard, according to which the dollar was automatically regarded as the equivalent of gold. And he said the US is issuing dollars well in ex excess of its reserves. And in fact, de Gaulle ordered the Bank of France to demand 80% of what the Americas owned in gold. And they, he sent a battleship to um, the US to bring home uh, gold. <laughs> Uh, from from uh, the New York Fed's vaults, and and of course I think that was what prompted. I think he thought of this doing the similar thing, you know. In, in the um, August fifteenth, nineteen seventy one, Nixon went on TV to announce that the gold window had been closed. The U.S. would no longer redeem foreign government dollar holdings with gold, and this, of course, was the final cutting of the link between paper money and gold. And which has been fraying slowly since 1914. Um, uh, Steele covers the um, last, uh, the period since 1971 a little. I mean, he, he says a significant economic factor of the last 20 years had been the willingness of the Chinese to export goods to the US in return for government debt. So that dollars sent to China for merchandise came back as low interest loans, uh, and there was no link to gold, of course. Um, by, by 2012, the Chinese had monetary reserves of 3.24 trillion, um, and the US, of course, had accumulated the world's largest international debt of 15, over 15 trillion dollars and growing. Uh, th this is what Larry Summers, the American uh, Treasury, uh, official called a kind of balance of financial terror. The Chinese fear a collapse in the dollar, the Americans a collapse in foreign funding. Uh, still, it's a great point that US, the US of today is not the Britain of the 1940s. Britain had been bankrupted by two world wars and needed dollars or gold to pay for imports. The US can still pay its bills in the currency it prints, a currency acceptable to the world. He, he points out, he says, at the time of the Suez crisis, the US government holdings of British securities amounted to $1 per resident, whereas China's holdings of US securities today are $1,000 per resident. So he said the US in the 1940s and 50s could provoke a sterling crisis without much cost to itself, but he said the Chinese can't do the same at the moment. Um, well, I think this, this, is, uh, this is just wishful thinking on the part of the Americans. Uh, Keynes uh, once quoted the old saying, you know, oh, your banker, a thousand pounds, you're at his mercy, or him a million, and the position is reversed. But uh, at Bretton Woods, they find that wasn't true. And I think the Americans will also find that that isn't true. Very good. Is there any criticisms or questions? Criticisms or questions? It annoyed me good. It annoyed me good. I'm glad you're annoyed, Bob, <laughs> in that respect, if that's the reason why you're annoyed. I think annoyed. Rather than yes. well, it, was a, it was a story um, I've heard before, usually here. Um, <laughs> yes. In, <laughs> nowhere else. You don't hear it anywhere else. Not, not, not in Channel 4 <laughs> News or anywhere like that. So. <laughs> um, but in, in, in bits and pieces and that, but I thought that was a very, um, a very good. 
historical uh, narrative. Uh, I think the only thing it lacked was um, perhaps a normative libertarian element. Uh, you, you stuck to the facts. You didn't, um, you didn't speculate about how things might be better or what ought to have happened, perhaps. Well, I mean, it's a big story. And uh, we can all have a take on it. And uh, uh, my major point was really that the British Empire fell because Britain was broke. Now, I have own particular views. Uh, and um, my particular views are that Britain should never have got involved in either World War I or World War II. You know, those are my views, but they, they can be controversial. But I'm just really in this talk pointing out what the problem was. And the problem was Britain was broke. And. Um, I don't think that's fully appreciated. Uh, people could still think that war pays, don't they? And of course, the well, well uh, you know, the I two wars damaged Britain, but also the empire damaged Britain as well. That, that the cost of the wars and the cost of the empire. <laughs> you know, I think the position is they think at the end. I mean, the Scottish debate. This, the, the, I saw Galloway up in. Um, been shown on TV, and uh, he just said, you know, uh, why, why keep the union? Well, we defeated fascism, and uh, you know, this is this this is how the Second World War is portrayed. Well, fi fine, that Germany was defeated, but of course, uh, Britain was broke. You know, that is uh, that is perfectly clear, and. Um, she was, she was uh, damaged at the end of World War I, but not completely broke. And it, is, and, and the, the, it was the second war that finished the job off. I mean, this is, uh, this is clear. When you say, you say Britain was broke, that is a status with manner of speaking, because you know, uh, Britain's wealth comes from whoever yeah, as victims it can predate to extract money from. Um, and the, the radical libertarian view that uh, you should default on all state debt uh, and uh, simply rely on, you know, private holdings or whatever, what, what consequences might that have had if, if we'd done that instead of borrowing money? Well, uh, who's defaulting, you see? It's the British government that owes uh, the money uh, and often during during a war time, uh, it owes money to its own citizens. You know, so it's defaulting yeah. to, to I mean, lots I mean, of its own money, citizens. Money, but, money to its citizens but, who who lent it money on yeah. on the expectation they'll get money back by the on their behalf, as we know, if we want to be very radically libertarian. Um, but what I what I haven't what I haven't really heard. Because, you know, Rothbard said that you know, states, they should just simply default, that's it, default. Now it sounds good from a, a theory point of view, but what would be the practical consequences of how, how terrible and damaging, or in fact magical and beneficial, would it be if a state did such a thing? I mean, Argentina keeps doing it up to a point, but if a state, if a state absolutely defaults on a massive debt to its own citizens or foreign governments, what might be the upshot? Well, in, in this particular instance, which I'm talking about, which mm -hmm. is the f fall of a great power, right, Britain, yeah. and great powers are judged by uh, their, eco their economic, military might, mm -hmm. and their... Um, now, the British Empire was the sign you know, that Britain was a great power, and all I'm pointing out is the British state could no longer afford yeah. to run it. That's all. Now. It could, of course, default on all its debts, but that just means that it's not going to be able to run the empire anymore. Now, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not shedding any tears about that, of mm. course, but I'm just pointing out how it looked to people in 1946 and 1947. And what, what, what are the effects of a government defaulting? Well, I think that if you buy government stock, and I, I'm, a, I'm an eth ethical investor, you know, I never buy government stock. But if you buy government stock, you've got everything coming to you, quite frankly. Yeah, that, that is, that's the ethical argument. If you, if you buy government stock, you've got it all coming to you. The point is, when it comes to good and if, if a state defaults and it comes to them good and bad, 
I suspect it's not just going to be you know, easy. I think there's going to be you know, what, I'm, what I'd like to see is a libertarian economist really work through what the consequences. Economic well, it's, it's not. I, I don't think it's. Di I don't think it's difficult, Paul. Because <coughs> I, I mean, yeah. if the state defaults and it cannot raise more capital mm. on the money markets, you know, it depends what that state does. If it doesn't do very much, well, the consequences are uh, not so significant. But if the state is running the bloody health service, the education system, this, that, and the other. And it can no longer fund it. Yeah, that's that's the consequences. Yes, and it would be it would be a massive dislocation to the economy. But do you think uh, if and if, if if an economy if a state or an economy adjusted quickly to free market principles, do you think they could overcome the the uh, kicking the guts of that would? Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people would suddenly find out that a lot of the investments they've made were worth nothing. And you find a lot of people. A lot of people who invested in the continuation of the state going bankrupt. There would be a dislocation. But you typically get could, it. Could it? Could it? Could it? Would the market adjust rapidly, or would it be so slow that you would probably find, you know, fascists rising or something like that? Well, you could. I was about to say, you know, one of the things that you could get in that situation, obviously, is a, a bloody revolution. You yeah, know? exactly. And another thing that happens in that situation when governments run out of money, and it's not, you know, it's not something that's not happened mm. is hyperinflation of course yeah they print a lot of money so yeah, but that's more, you, that's, you know that's more, could, state, that's more state action could, could, what i'm wondering could, is does the market act faster than 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 a, a revolution than politics you know i think it depends on what people think yeah. and what what they'll um accept you know and um you know if, if there are a sufficient number of people who say well the state's defaulting but okay we're going to be okay because we're still going to carry on producing mm. and um, all the things which the state used to do will do it ourselves you know in that sort of happy scenario uh, things would be okay but um, a lot of people don't think like that do they? No, 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 they don't, no. a lot of people think politically for that which is, uh, and which is why I think when the, when the 2008 crash happened that's why suddenly Keynes, I thought, you know, Keynes was a laughable embarrassment. It had been shown over the whole period of the uh, late 70s and 80s what a disastrous and silly idea it was. Uh, and that nobody would have thought that prices, incomes, policy, all these sorts of things in the early 70s and 60s were sensible ideas now. Then all of a sudden, come the 2008 crash, all these things have been dusted down. It's the first thing the politicians reach for. Yeah, but they the first thing that they thought we'll do is we'll bail out the banks. Uh, Presumably because they thought if we let the banks crash, there will be uh, the market won't adjust fast enough, and there will be political action. If we don't take the political action in Parliament, there will be on the streets of political action or whatever. Yeah, fascists or communists or the Islamists, I don't know, God knows what else in it. But I mean, the, well, uh, the, 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 there is the, there is the fact that it. Although you, you had this stagflation, which was the refutation of Keynesianism, yeah. complete refutation, of course the Gospels didn't think, you know, the, that's for you know, Mises and those like, they didn't predict that the, you know, the stagflation, that uh, inflation was the opposite to unemployment no, and so on. The, 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 so it was no paradox at all f from an Austrian point of view. And the, you know, the classical economists also didn't have this. But the thing is, which you might notice, and this is the reason why you had the return of Keynes in uh, 2007, it never left the textbooks. In other words, if you yeah. buy the textbooks in the, up to 2007, a textbook published in 2000, or you know, one of the main textbooks, you still get the Keynesian analysis, you still get the Hicks thing. So uh, the ironic thing that he, you know, Hicks didn't understand Keynes, and Keynes hated it. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a critique of the textbooks about Keynesianism. The, um, the Swedish economists, Axel Lane, from, uh, brought out a book on, on Keynes and Keynesian economics where he exposed the books that are written by the American economists like L.R. Klein to be absolutely, uh, showed a great misunderstanding of what his, th his, his theories were. Yeah, they felt the Hicks. You know, this is what I said when I said the Hicks. Uh, uh, Hicks, uh, well, I think... So in more, many ways, the well, think, was being misrepresented that's right. through the textbooks yeah, yeah, like, you know, yeah, yeah, like but, but, from that are being sold but actually, in the universities. Actually, if, these you, guys like millions of, you, know, if you ask me who was the better economist, Hicks or Keynes, I would start thinking for a moment that it was Keynes. You know, Hicks is right in his main contention, uh, and Keynes is wrong 
in the main contention it's to do with size law, or actually, you see, Keynes picked on size law because it was a little recondite thing, but what Keynes absolutely hates is equilibrium. That's what he hates. And there's some, actually, even Bob doesn't like equilibrium yeah, all that much. Yeah, it was a study of disequilibrium, though, wasn't it? Uh, uh, well, Keynes and said he's that... showing that, like, you know, the size law does not add up to, like, equi you know, that basically it's a fallacy. Well, well, y but, equals C plus I, where I is interchangeable with savings, and that you get basically, it doesn't all match up like that. That's what he's saying. And that's where, like, that's the, that's the contribution that he made it, in that understanding. Yeah, yeah but it wasn't a contribution, it was an anti-contribution, because Paul said earlier, you know, how, does, how quickly does the market adjust? Well, of course, the market adjusts almost instantaneously, and Hicks knew that. And uh, so I think Hicks was right on equilibrium, or if you like, on size law, and Keynes was wrong on equilibrium or size law. And uh, so I think Hicks, uh, and of course this is Hicks's terrible criticism of, uh, of, of even Mises on the trade cycle. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, the Mises wants a lag, and Hicks says, where do you get your lag from? Mm -hmm. the, market does, yeah, the market doesn't take a long time to adjust. It adjusts. It's adjusting as we're having this speech now. The, the price system's going up and down and adjusting all the time. Uh, so, so, but, uh, you know, I do think that uh, what would happen is more like what Steve said, the many idea. I think people, compulsory education would be in trouble and so on, but I think people would soon come round and provide some alternatives, but I shouldn't speak as chairman anyway. <laughs> we'll get carried away with Keynes when we go into Keynes. Is there anyone else who wants this? Do you want to come back on that, on what I've just said? Say it's nonsense? No, I just, I just see it basically that, you know, Keynes is, you know, gone, well, one of his, you know, you know, contributions to economics was exposing uh, a, a virtual error, like in Say's Law. <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, you are a Keynesian, like, yeah. Well, well, I think no, that's no, exactly no. wrong. He's all right. Say he's right, right. Keynes is wrong. It didn't right. work for a bit, you know, like, you know. Then no, it didn't work for a bit. And that's another stupid idea of Keynes, that, that, that uh, things work sometimes, but later on they don't work. God, that is the most... You know, I rather hoped when I picked up Karl Popper on the poverty of historicism that I was going to get a criticism of that idea. Sadly, of course, Popper uh, you know, didn't give such a criticism. But there, there needs to be a book written and titled something like the poverty of historicism and hit this stupid idea that times change. We're in, we're in different times yeah, now. You know, uh, they, they used to, eat, f they used to eat, eat, eat their food by shoving it through their ears in ancient Greece. And now, now, we, do it, now we do it by sticking it through our mouth. Uh, but never mind, <laughs> they'll be shoving it up their backside. Oh, it's not the first time. <laughs> but uh, I shouldn't talk so much as chairman. I don't know, it's entertaining. <laughs> but, going to, um, I have to say, that is the most impressive talk you've ever given that I've heard. Stephen, uh, uh, yeah. For, yeah. for good. Well, I'm, glad, I'm glad it was a positive uh, moment. <laughs> <laughs> the climax, you're going further into the book. I have a comment about that, that actually the, the book. book. Yes. You know, the, my impression of when I read that book oh, was, really? that the, um, was that the uh, Americans were more hard asked about the loans that they had agreed with Britain than the actual when they came to dealings at the IMF. You know, the, sorry, the, the Bretton Woods agreement. You know, it moved on from like Bretton Woods to like the loans, and they were like, basically, they were saying, no, this is the price. We, yeah, we're, not, we're not, we're not, we're not giving, we're not, we're not um, coming down about this. You owe us this money. Yeah, but you, you have to remember the relationship between Britain and America. Um, that at the Ottawa Conference, I think, in the 19, early 1930s, that um, there'd been trade restrictions on American goods. Uh, and there'd been a limitation of the free trade uh, between Britain and America, which has existed. And there was a sort of limitation on American goods, and they were kept out of the British Empire, in fact, the British colonies. Right. And uh, I think this, this was quite uh, uh, annoying to the Americans. Ah, so uh, so th there was that point. Uh, and I think at the end of 1945, the Americans... Um, and lots of people, I mean, people still think this way, that Britain had won the war and was going to be a very important part, uh, power in the post-war world, just as she'd been uh, after World War I. 
And uh, they didn't quite twig that Britain was, as I made the point, broke. So, you know, Brit Britain was uh, a partner in the war, but after the war, she was also going to be a rival. You know, that's how the Americans saw it. So they were going to drive a fairly hard deal. And it was, I quoted Atchison in the talk, uh, when he heard that Britain was pulling out of Burma, pulling out of Greece, pulling out of Palestine, pulling out of India, all within two, a fortnight, you know, they announced all this. They were shocked, you know. Bloody hell, what's this? And of course, India, I mean, they must have realized this, India was the jewel in the crown, you know. The British Empire was really about India. So yeah, yeah. a lot of the parts of the British Empire were staging posters to India. And the wealth that had been made out of uh, India. Uh, uh, there was no wealth made out of India. Um, but but, but so, 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 so in, in a sense, once, one, one, once, it, once India goes, uh, that is in a sense the end of the British Empire, really. You know, there are a lot of the other stuff, the African stuff and this, they're all, they're all uh, bit, bit players in, in the British more, Empire. more people live in India than the entirety of Africa. Which is the fact that people forget. But. Yeah, but I, I'm just, I, I, was, I was really looking at the thing from the mentality of the uh, imper huh? imperialist, if you like. You know? Yeah. you know, you had a viceroy in India. You know, you had the, you had the uh, Victoria was empress of India, you know. She wasn't bloody empress of, uh, you know, um, Zanzibar or whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever place you had in Africa, you know. They, they didn't count, really. But India counted. For what? No, no, go on. Sorry, sorry, I'm unfair, but... No, um, yeah, yeah, you haven't had a talk yet, have you? So go on. Yeah. Well, I was sorry. just going to, to sort of, you know, like I say, I mean, for the benefit of those of us who aren't entirely familiar with it, could you just set out what say his law is? Because it's been mentioned in terminal media. Oh, well, well, uh, well, Steve, uh, Steve did define it in the talk. Did you? Oh, it's no. basically, say, it's, it, it is. I think accurately. It's, it's often been um, given different interpretation, but it should be that supply creates its own. Ah, a horrible error. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he, he has explained that in the talk. Oh, he's, going, he's, he's going to explain it now. Oh, so supply creates its own demand. Mm. What, why do you think that's, that's the Keynesian thing? Well, as you say in your talk. Well, we should say ab supply then. Is that is that better? What's that? Apt. Oh, yeah. yeah, appropriate that's, supply. That's better, that's better. Yeah. But I mean, uh, this, this, despite what Bob says, I think it's okay that, it, you know, if you produce goods which people want, apt supply, then you shouldn't, you, you don't need to worry about demand. You know, if I produce something that um, other people want to buy, then uh, I will also have the resources to demand other things, you know. That's the, that, that says law, really. Or another way of putting it, Supply and demand are exactly the same. So, so when you create supply, apt, so it has to be with good entrepreneurship, exactly stuff, stuff that people stuff. want. There has to be stuff that people want. It's but when you produce, when you pro when you produce, in the economy, when you produce something that people that want, that is the, case, uh, the only way. That is the only way. And this is where Keynes goes utterly wrong. You've got no insight at all. That is the only way you can boost demand. You can I only must, boost demand by supply. I must say something here. Having stopped hiccuping and burping over the last 10 minutes. Oh, um, yes, uh, supply is the only, well, it's not the source of demand, supply is demand. Yes. This is Cain. This is not Cain. This is Say. Yep. So, you produce something, right, that's worth having, okay, yep. at a price. So, okay, at a price, you might lose on it, you might gain on it, you might break even. Yep. Sometimes you have to just sell it to cut your losses. So, yeah. Supply is exchanged for supply. And money, under the, under the gold system, is just another supply. So we exchange supplies for supplies. And surprise, 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 it works rather well. And doesn't need fiat this, fiat the other, governments intervening in any way whatsoever. So there you have, but it's not the supply creates demand. If it's a duff supply, as the man says, if it's an inact supply, it creates its own... Yeah. It needs entrepreneurship. It, it creates its own bankruptcy. It needs entrepreneurship. It does indeed. But it doesn't need anyone worrying about it, particularly. No, not at all. Oh. Anyone should worry about it. It produces something they hope will make a profit. 
There's no reason for a government to intervene. There's no reason for a bank to intervene. There's no reason for anything of that kind. But, but of course, people who... You just had money, which happens to be a commodity. This commodity is exchanged for other commodities. Okay. Where's the government in all this? Nowhere. Unnecessary. Yeah. That's the way of approaching it. People who worry are their entrepreneurs. Well, they should know. They have a cause to worry. Yeah, that's right. Because they may not break even. And we don't have to worry about them because if they fail, they, we don't lose much. I mean, whereas if the state goes in, we do have to worry because when the state loses out, we all bloody lose out. Whereas if the entrepreneur loses out, well, we don't even know about it. He knows about it, but we don't know about it. So it is... Uh, and Keynes seems to think that you can boost demand just by inflation. He thinks, and sadly, even higher, well, he agrees with him. Everyone says, well, there's been so much stimulus, by which they mean inflation. Well, of course, inflation is not a stimulus it is and possible. cannot be. It is possible in the short run, and it was not anticipated, for the creation of um, military units to represent real uh, purchasing power. Yes. Oh, yes, certainly purchase it power. It can be yeah. done in the short oh, run. You can purchase. And the short run could be a year or so. And while this, while this purchasing power is being handed out, merely by printing it, in a sense, or yep. putting, it in the, uh, putting it in the books, these people can, for a while, spend more. Oh, they can spend more. We're not only spending yes. more, the rest of us who don't realise there's going to be inflation, we're not saving enough to make up for the fact there's going to be monetary depreciation. But, but it's Therefore, not. Therefore, for a while, there can be everyone seemingly better off, but it can't possibly last. Well, that, that's the Austrian analysis. I don't, yeah, but I think I think the Austrian analysis needs to be corrected. This, like this, it's true that uh, inflation produces purchasing power. That's undoubtable. However, this inflation doesn't boost demand. In fact, it lowers demand, and it lowers demand immediately. Uh, immediately after inflation, demand is lowered, and it's lowered. Mainly because, and this is a good Austrian thing, because it immediately makes economic calculation more inefficient. So immediately it is a lowering, a de facto lowering of demand when they think they're boosting demand. It is impossible to boost demand with inflation. But certainly you create purchasing power, you spread demand. That's what you do. You spread demand to new people. New people have money and buy things which they couldn't afford to do it before, especially with their welfare people you know, who, 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 who are not doing the job or something. It's not, then, look, it's not essentially different. If I, from, if I go into my basement and print 50,000 pounds right. on the that's machine right. and I go down into the centre of Wimbledon and I spend it, that's you, right. you know, that's and, and that, that is the government solution to economic growth or, or uh, one of the solutions. But of course, yes. Uh, I, I certainly gain, you know, the counterfeiter, I gain temporarily. Uh, the people who, re, who I buy goods from initially will make some gain, but as it gradually filters through the uh, economy, not only is demand um, messed about with, you know, because we don't know what, uh, what are going to be the long-term mm. uh, production structures, it's messed about with that because you know, I, I'm just a one-off. And um, it also makes things more expensive eventually for, for other people. You know, they have, to, they have to fund this, the inflation taxes, they call it. I just trust out the eventually. <laughs> uh, and, and that, of course, is why counterfeiting down the ages has been punishable uh, well, quite, no. quite often by death. Well, the king wants to counterfeit, <laughs> but they mustn't. But, you know, the central banks can do it, as long as they do it on a grand scale. Yeah. <laughs> Has that answered your case, okay, say, law? That's it, yeah. <laughs> Paul? Yeah, well, it's similar to the thing I was going to say before anyway, to follow up on this. And the, it seems to me that the key um, insight about economics that Keynes denied is this. Uh, the, the point of doing any work at all is to be productive. Um, the, there's no point. Yeah, we, can all do, we can all do work that doesn't pay anything. Nobody wants us to do it. We all do work that there's absolutely no demand for us. It's absolutely efficient to create for us still. The point of the, the point of work is to be productive. And I was watching on Sunday night. Uh, there was a, a superb uh, drama documentary on the History Channel about 
about um, it's over sort of about eight episodes about how all the uh, leaders of the Second World War sort of started off in the First World War and proved the position they are. It follows the lives of Hitler and Stalin and Churchill and Roosevelt. So it's very good. Uh, this has got to the bit where um, Hitler's come back from the First World War and he goes to the Labour Exchange in defeated Germany. He says, uh, and he says, have you got any work? He says, oh, there's no work. No work? There'll be fucking loads of work to be done. How can, how can there be no work? How can you go back to a country defeated in war and be told there's no work? The only, the only situation there's no work is if we've if we're all got super abundance around us. Short of superabundance, there's always work to be done. Yes. The point is, what is the work? The, the work is supposed to be productive. It's supposed to be work that other people are willing to buy. And it seems to me that that is the key thing that the, the Keynes, the Keynes in his, his epigones who follow them, deny. They think that work is something other than productivity, that, that it's something that the government can create or that we have to invent, or it's a real struggle to go around finding work. But all you have to do is open your eyes and see, use your senses to see human dissatisfaction. And it's obvious that there is work to be done. And the only reason it isn't done is because the market is not allowed to clear. And the market is not allowed to clear because of politics. There's more work than there are people to do. That seems to me the, the, the crux of it. Keynes elevated this error into a whole Nice little learner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Into, into, a, into, a, into, a, into a rather more elaborate era that's gone on and on and on. And, and everyone agree. I mean, it was yeah. the, the 1930s was the biggest blow to the market process. I mean, people have never been uh, satisfied with the market since since the great mass mass unemployment. But those people are only unemployed because they are paid to be unemployed. Yeah. But, but you have, you have people who say we need we need arms we need arms contracts. Endless yeah. stories about we've got to have high speed too because it'll create oh, jobs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's endless flat trap about government schemes and buying our way. I mean, it's, it all stems from the same error, which is that the point of work, of the point of doing any work, is to be productive. Otherwise, there's no point in doing it. It's just I think the simple thing to see here, and uh, it's the politicians who obscure the matter, is that if private individuals spend the money, that would create jobs. Yeah. And, it, you know, they can do it just as well as governments. Mm. And they'll probably do it to, certainly, to bring more satisfaction to themselves than the government ever will. Um, yes, the government can take my money and create jobs on some things like HS2 or the Olympic Games in 2012. Or the Egyptian government could, could take the money of the Egyptian taxpayer uh, in the time of the pharaohs and create jobs on the pyramids, you know. But uh, I think the Egyptians could have spent it better for themselves in those days. And uh, I could spend my money better than uh, the, um, Olymp the, 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 the Olympic Authority. I could, I'm <laughs> certain of that. It strikes me that the Pharaoh... It's gold investment in Tutankhamun inside the pyramid. It strikes me that the Pharaohs is a misnomer. We also call them the young Pharaohs. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pun. Yes. <laughs> I shouldn't be thinking though. Do you, well, you want to come back? I was just thinking, uh, you, you were saying the Say's Law is uh, the supply creates its own demand. Um, would HS2 then be kind of a, a disproof of that law? Because uh, if they, they go ahead and they produce uh, this HS2 uh, to provide uh, sort of transport for goods and industries where there's sort of no demand for for the actual um, uh, for, the, for the service at the moment, uh, you'd end up then with kind of a disproof of it if it's not fulfilled, if if there's not suddenly a, a burst of. Um, uh, economic activity along the HS2 route. Um, well, what, what, what you get then is simply the, uh, and this is likely if they if uh, do run it, is that you'll get the railway running into loss. That's all. Which I mean, the Humber, Humber Bridge was built 50 years ago. It's always been running at a loss. It's subsidised. You know, Pay for it's itself in 200,000 years, apparently. Um, you know, and there are lots of government projects around the world which uh, run at a loss. Um, I mean, the Spanish, evidently, government has built airports all around Spain, you know. 
which no one flies to. Mm -hmm. and, and shopping centres and housing estates and all sorts of things. Yeah. It's absolutely awash with abandoned buildings. And solar farms. <laughs> well, we, 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 we might be able... No, not solar farms, wind farms we can... Oh, yeah, but but the manufacturing base, when he wrote this book, you know, General Theory of Money, Interest and Employment, the manufacturing base in the country must have been much bigger than it is now. Well, I mean, it, you know, well, well, so, a lot of the bloody has been dismantled, you know, like the manufacturing industry by Thatcher. Girl, that's true. Nothing. There's nothing. She was nothing. a one. <laughs> you know, I can't, uh, and Keynes certainly couldn't, forecast uh, what the structure of um, the modern economy should be. Right. And as long as we have people purchasing the goods that they want, with increased wealth, you'll, you'll have new industries developing. Mm -hmm. And they won't be the same as the industries in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Anymore, the, the, the economic structure of the 1930s is the same as the economic structure of the 1830s, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I don't know if people uh, in the 1930s were moaning people moving off the land. They're probably they're doing that in China now. Mm -hmm. There's a certain sort of thing. I mean, it doesn't hurt when you drop it on your foot. It's not a real output. In other words, services don't count. It's got to be, you know, stuff turned out, sold to foreigners. Well, no, it doesn't do that at all. Services are also on production. No, no, I mean, I often say that there is only one decade where, and this is the first industrial nation by chance in, in, in England, there's only one decade where the, the vast majority of the workforce was in manufacturing, and that was the 1950s. So throughout the Industrial Revo Revolution from 17... Uh, 50 to 1850, the vast majority of this country were not wor workers were not working in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. it was a, now, strangely, as soon as they were working, so in, as, soon, as soon as they all were, as soon as they, as soon as they all were working in in manufacturing in 1953, it was only a few years, and by 1959, they were going out of manufacturing again. Mm -hmm. So it's just that one, that one decade. Sorry. And there, there is the also a point that this, these are just definitions, you know, manufacturing services yeah. or whatever you know. You could easily, mm -hmm. if you, you can easily split service sector up into different kinds of yeah. uh, economic areas, just as you could split manufacturing up into different kinds of areas. Yeah. You can go into the, if you look in the financial sectors of any newspaper, you can, sh you, you have the shares and the share prices, and the, all the newspapers, quite often they have different sectors, you know, you know, some will be the same across the newspaper, but others are different. And, uh, you know, you have things like mining or um, oil and gas or, or things like that. You know, what, does it really matter how you define them? Uh, uh, yeah. So you define one, it, one sector in one way and say, well, we've got to keep manufacturing, we've got to keep it at a certain level. Monaco is notoriously poor with a low standard of living because of its total lack of manufacturing. <laughs> well, look, Lux Luxembourg is one of the um, uh, wealthier countries in Europe. And it used to have coal mining there, a small amount of coal mining, but they've got rid of all that now. And they're much wealthier. Um, False teeth and sausage skin. <laughs> One of that lot was over there, I have to say, I have read it somewhere. The canard about manufacturing industry is, is like the one about natural resources, that, uh, uh, in fact, usually natural resources is an absolute curse, it means you've got all sorts of horrific political bastards. Why do they not so make a thugs, thugs, thugs fight, fighting over you and oppressing people? Or in Japan, no natural resources whatsoever. It's uh, done very well, relatively speaking. But. Well, that is the point, isn't it, in... Uh a modern economy, that is you import, you, te you tend to import what you want, you work on it to produce a new finished good, and then export that good. There's no, there's no reason why you know, the, people it, it, live, the people who live on the Gaza Strip can't enjoy the same style of life as the people who, live in, as the people who live in Hong Kong. The only thing that's holding them back is their stupid outlook on the world. That's what's wrong. Well, and it's <laughs> and apart from I'm not sure they're allowed to have any airports and ports. That's the trouble. Yeah, but they're only not allowed that because they're stupid out in the world. <laughs> and similarly with Hong Kong. But you can, you can just be a little, a little state that clings to the side of the Mediterranean and do very well. Um, yeah, but it's not their fault that they're on the siege. Of course it is. Oh. <laughs> 
it's, well, it's, it's one of those, I haven't looked at the Israel Palestine situation. I've, I've come to the sophisticated conclusion that it's, it's six of one and half a dozen of the other. Um, when it comes who's to, six, is it? <laughs> when it comes to who's to blame for that. But um, it started the six first. Britain, probably. <laughs> yes. yes. Any more questions? I think we've done it. Well, thank you very much indeed, Steve, well for the wonderful talk. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done.